Glad to have you here. Our next uh, session in this track is on the topic of building the quantum stack from qubits to applications. And we have uh, two panelists, Dr. Celia Merzbacher, who is the executive director of the Quantum Economic Development Consortium, QEDC. And we have Dr. Jim Kushmerick, who's the director of the Physical Measurement Laboratory at the National Institute for Standards and Technology, NIST. Please welcome Dr. Mersbacher and Dr. Kushmerick. Can we sit down? Turn the lights on over here. Hey, right, there we go. We'll switch I think this is perfect. So this is like uh, the Johnny Carson show or something. Jim and I here to talk a little bit um, about quantum, about the national strategy, and about, in particular, the role of the National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, which is the organization that started and was directed by Congress to make sure that this consortium of stakeholders called QEDC was created. And so um, I want to thank you, first of all, for your support of QEDC. Um, but what we wanted to spend a little bit of time today doing is um, talking about the, the sort of big picture. And NIST is an organization that has such broad expertise and deep. And uh, a lot of people may not know much about it. Uh, and the fact that there are multiple Nobel Prize winners in quantum who work for NIST. So, uh, Jim, could you just give us a little bit about NIST and the part of the organization that you run, the, the Physical Measurement Laboratory? Sure, ha happy to. And, and um, thank you for this opportunity. It's always, it's always great to be able to talk about NIST. It's you know, really where I've spent most of my career. So at a very high level, it's important to understand where we sit in the federal government. So NIST is part of the Department of Commerce. And our mission is really to promote innovation and industrial competitiveness. We do that through measurement science, standards, and technology support. And it's all with an eye towards economic security and improving you know, our way of life. So it's a hugely broad mission. You know, and that's what's one of the things that's great is that we get to work in a number of areas. The really important parts about NIST are one, that we're a non-regulatory agency. So we can work really closely with industry. We can help them solve problems because they can come to us and say, well, you know, we can't do something now. How do we do this? We do this in semiconductors. We do this in biomanufacturing. We obviously do this in quantum technology as well as others. And that, that close connection is really important for us delivering on our mission. Um, yes, we have a, a number of Nobel Prizes um, in quantum information science, and really the, the, the key to NIST getting involved is the fact that kind of to do precision measurements, you have to make quantum measurements. The best measurements today are quantum based. And so we were there early and we have a 20 year program in quantum information science, which we can talk about a little bit more later. Great. Yeah, I mean, this is one of those fields where there's metrology for quantum and quantum for metrology. So it kind of goes both ways. Um, maybe I'll just, um, remind people about QEDC and the relationship we have with NIST and other parts of government. Um, QEDC is a consortium of stakeholders. It was established in 2018. Congress called for it in the National Quantum Initiative Act where it said NIST shall establish such a consortium. Um, and so we do get some funding from NIST and some other parts of government as well. And increasingly from the non-government members, we have about 250 organizations. Most of them are corporate. We're very much industry driven, which is why there's such a great partnership mm -hmm. with NIST and its industry and innovation uh, mission because it's kind of early days for quantum. And the industry, frankly, is, uh, needs a lot of metrology and uh, innovation support at this time. So um, I'd like to, I guess, learn a little bit more about the sort of history that you referred to. Um, what are some areas or examples of quantum technology or enabling technologies, maybe single photon sources, for example, um, where NIST has played a role uh, in the discovery space? Yeah, so much of our early work, so the Physical Measurement Laboratory control, is kind of performs the National Metrology Institute functions for the United States. So we underpin all the measurements for research and commerce. 
So one of the, the standards that we hold is the standard for time. And to build a better atomic clocks led to research on laser cooling and trapping of atoms. And Bill Phillips won the Nobel Prize for that. And that was fundamental work that needed to be done so that we could have higher precision clocks. And you know, atomic clocks are really one of the first uh, quantum technologies, this quantum 2.0, if you will, that's out there in, in development, the, the chip scale atomic clocks and everything that's underpinning GPS and other areas. And that work you know, led to a number of other areas. You can kind of connect the dots, if you will, um, to trapping of ions. And so the demonstration of the quantum logic gate by Dave Weinland and colleagues, um, again, another Nobel Prize, and which spun, spun off into two different uh, quantum companies that are here today, are both kind of have clear lineage back to that group. So there's definitely this, the starts there. The other area is that the voltage standard, you know, so if you have a voltmeter and you want to make sure you, you know, it works, you need to provide it with a known voltage, are based on Josephson Junction uh, superconducting systems. And work in there and in squids and in other types of superconducting systems really led us, led NIST to be working in uh, Josephson Junction um, qubits. And, which, and then that work moved to, to Google and there was the initial uh, quantum supremacy, whether or not, however we want to define that these days, work kind of again was derived from that. Another area, as you mentioned, is we have the responsibility for optical power. And that can be high power lasers and understanding that all the way down to single photons. So we have a, a, a lot of work on single photon sources and detectors. So we really run the gamut, but the takeaway is that it's all tied back to our metrology mission. That's why we do this work. That's why we have the expertise to help uh, you all. So I'm going to sort of jump ahead, actually, because uh, what you said prompted me to think that maybe some in the audience would like to know how you collaborate with those who are maybe interested in these areas or have something that they'd like to share, you know, discuss with NIST, mm -hmm. um, maybe in confidentiality. How do you do business with the outside world? So we have many different mechanisms. So one of our, our most valuable right now is the QEDC. We're, we're a member as well as kind of a partly funding the QEDC. So the interaction there directly with companies is critical. It gives us inside, not inside knowledge, because it's shared with the entire consortium, but we can understand what are the challenges that the industry has, and we can work collectively, research projects with QEDC, with the member companies, and this to kind of solve some of those challenges. Um, but we have direct uh, kind of bilateral, if you will, one-on-one -on -one interactions through CRADAs, Cooperative Research Agreements, where we can help with companies. But for the most part, we like to work across an industry sector just because that way we're supporting the entire industry and not just one individual company. But one of the most important aspects is really how we interact with academia. And our success has been largely based on work through joint institutes. So out in, the, uh, out in Colorado, we have JILA, which is with NIST in the University of Colorado Boulder. And here in Maryland, or just across the river in Maryland, we have two joint institutes, the Joint Quantum Institute and QUICS with the University of Maryland. And having NIST researchers embedded on the academic campus, working with the researchers, getting the new ideas, and, and being in that environment has been critical both for, I think, NIST success as well as the university success in those two campuses. That's, that's great. And you have some user facilities as well on the campus. And yes, yeah, we do have, um, so on the Gaithersburg campus here, we have a Center for Nanoscale Science and Technology, CNST, which is a, a full research clean room. And it's open to external users. It's a pay, it's a pay to use service, but it's a very, reasonable rates compared to the kind of cost of all the equipment where people can come in, do prototype development, kind of ramp up and then figure out how they can transition it um, for fabrication for small companies, even large companies. Excellent. Um, so are there areas where NIST is, is working today that are relevant to quantum that, that folks maybe should know more about? I, I hope so, and I think I will say yes. Uh, yeah, there, there's, I mean, we are continuing, so under the NQI, 
we were tasked with, with two things, setting up a consortium, which is the QEDC, which has been hugely successful. And the other part is really to maintain our fundamental research in quantum technology, quantum development. So we are continuing to push you know, the, the realm of what quantum measurements are and quantum systems. But a lot of what we've been working on that may be having even more impact is the enabling technologies. Um, you know, uh, low temperature quantum amplifiers that can be used to really kind of enhance the signal, different ways of coupling between qubits to reduce noise. Um, there's a lot of work in just kind of understanding the challenges for engineering up. And that's our, that's our next big push, to be honest. You know, it's, we've taken a science first approach because there's a lot of science to be understood in this quantum realm. But we're really at this pivot point, we think, that there's so much industry out there that how do we help on the engineering side? How do we increase what we can provide companies to really help transition technology, both from our laboratories out, which is one of our key things to do, is tech transfer is critical for us delivering, but also help industry transition from a kind of a prototype to a fully deployable system. Well, it's going to be really in, uh, interesting to see that develop. Um, so the S in NIST stands for standards. And um, I think a lot of people think that you're a standard setter, but um, maybe you can put a little bit of um, more detail around what the role at NIST is in, in the standard space. Yeah, I, I've many times heard that NIST sets the standard for, and in, in some cases for a measurement standard or for you know, the time standard or mass, you know, how we measure the kilogram, that part is true. But in documentary standards, in, in use standards, it's really industry-led in the United States. So NIST brings technical expertise and is a convening body who can help define the right standards to do and how to do them effectively. But we don't set standards. We do this openly uh, through the community. So just as a, not a side note, but a, uh, a couple of months ago, uh, this administration released the um, U.S. standard strategy for emerging for critical and emerging technologies. And under that, it is defining how we want to see standards develop in these areas over time. Basically, that they need to be technologically sound and provide open, fair playing grounds for industry. So those are the two big kind of components. And under the standard strategy, NIST is tasked with delivering on these lofty goals. And it's easy to say this is what we want to do, but how do you get into the room you know, understand what needs to be done and make sure that the right standards are happening. So, um, as I said, in, uh, standards in the United States are industry driven. Industry needs to be there to, to vote in most of these standards bodies. NIST is there to help kind of define what needs to be done. And we're currently looking for quantum. Most of the quantum technology is, it's too early to have standards. But it's not too early to start thinking about how we would do standards, to start thinking about what's the terminology. Can we come to a nomenclature? Can we agree on what qubit fidelity means? Because when there's some standard that gets developed, it's all words. And we have to have an agreed upon language before we'll be able to write them. So there's a lot of pre-standardization work that can, can occur. The other place where standards are ready for, I think, is in a lot of the enabling technologies. A lot of what goes into a superconducting quantum computer are RF cables. And you know, how do you, what's the right standard for that? How do you measure the quality in those so that they're sold across international borders, you can understand. So there's lots of work that can be done. But we're not, we're not pushing, um, and again, we don't make standards in that sense for these kind of things, on specific standards for you know, definitely not what's the best qubit. People ask me that, and I say, I am agnostic. We love all qubits. We'll put that on the bumper sticker. Yeah. We love all qubits. Um, and, and I'll just jump in and say that QEDC also is not a standard setting organization. Mm -hmm. However, we have an extremely active standards committee, and they're really focusing on um, sort of identifying what will need to be standardized. We, of course, welcome all the QEDC members to participate in those conversations. We have liaison relationships with ISO and IEEE and other standard setting organizations. So they sometimes come to QEDC and say, would you review one of our drafts? Would you give us input? And so for those in the audience who are at companies that feel like, well, I don't have the time 
to be sending people to these standards meetings. It's too early, as you said. I think the QEDC is a great place for keeping a finger on the pulse. We kind of have a repository where we track all of the different standards activities. This is yet another area where quantum doesn't fit into one existing home when it comes to setting standards. And so it's happening at a lot of different organizations and um, that's probably the right thing because there's different kinds of quantum technologies and, and standards. Um, so QEDC has a, I think, useful role to play on behalf of the members. Yeah, and I, I want to tease out a little bit about what you said there. That's one of the real issues with the kind of emerging technology standards is, you know, industry will be involved when there's a profit. And we understand that there's a, you know, but when it's early stage, you know, investing people's time to travel, to sit on these committees, when it's not clear where things are going to go, it's hard to, you know, provide that input. So, you know, that's why NIST is working to determine where we collectively, the U.S. kind of constituents need to be and understand how to kind of make sure um, proper standards are set and specifically that restrictive uh, standards are not set that would, you know, preference one, uh, one country or one economy and give them an unfair advantage. So understanding what needs to be done and what needs to be blocked, if you will, at times. But the, I sort of view the hierarchy as that, that technical standard, capital S, at the top. But behind that, there are things like benchmarks, measuring progress, specifications, how are we going to measure and report. And that metrology piece underpins it all. So that's where, again, I think there are a lot of opportunities to work with NIST. Yes, there's a lot of opportunities there. And we're always interested in, in figuring out what those right benchmarks are. Um, there's a new effort with... Uh, uh, partner uh, National Metrology Institutes to help define what metrology is going to be needed to support the global economy in quantum. So that, you know, just because NIST can measure something, if, you know, the UK doesn't have that same technology, we can't compare. So, you know, we work internationally as a National Metrology Institute to make sure we have cross compatibility for international trade and just to really push the, the to lift all boats, as they say. Great. Um, so uh, I wanted to look at a, a different part of NIST. Maybe it's not within your organization, but I'm sure you're familiar and can share a little bit. Quantum computing, is, as I think this audience knows well, does pose some threats, uh, in particular to cybersecurity and the potential of uh, a sufficiently capable quantum computer to break some types of encryption, encryption that we all use every day. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the NIST-led post-quantum cryptographic standards effort? Sure, I'd be happy to. So, you know, as we all know, Shor's algorithm, you know, really motivated a lot of work in this field, both from the, you know, we kind of, people had posited what could be good, but when there was this definable threat to public key encryption, it made a lot of people stand up and say, okay, this is important. We need to be able to prepare for this. So back in 2016, NIST began work on what's called a post-quantum cryptography. So this is classical cryptography. This isn't QKD or using a quantum system. This is a classical cryptographic scheme, algorithm, that will be, or that is, resistant to both a quantum attack, a Shor's algorithm attack, or any other emerging quantum attacks as we understand them, and to classical attack. And this is important because it'll be deployable in our current systems. Um, so right now there are three algorithms that are out for comment, and we expect to have a final standard. And this again, and we have many ways of using the word standard at NIST, but a standard that then industry can take and develop into a product that then can be deployed across the, across the system. And it's, you know, I don't need to tell people, but you know, people worry about their credit card being stolen or something like that. No one's going to use a quantum computer to steal my credit card. I don't have that big of a limit on my credit card. It's not worth it. But from a national security and a broad economic security, there is a big driver to do this. So, you know, working on these uh, new algorithms and the new products and then getting it deployed because there's a long tail of how valuable information may be if it was collected now and decrypted later. So the sooner we get this out into the, into the wild, if you will, or onto our systems, the better we'll be for whenever... Uh, you know, a cryptographically relevant quantum computer is developed. So I am going to ask you, put you on the spot a little bit, about the 
the quantum approaches to cybersecurity, and QKD is a fairly mature um, type of technology that is takes advantage of, of quantum properties. Um, I think many are familiar with some of the U.S. government's positions with respect to using Q QKD on government systems or or even just national security systems. Is I believe NIST has done work in this area. I mean, you you do have some expertise and continue maybe to look at QKD and some of those types of yeah. quantum technologies. I would say roughly a decade ago, we had a, a concerted effort um, on QKD to really, because one of the things about it is to, to, to perform QKD, you have to build up a lot of the expertise that you can integrate into other quantum communication type systems. So single photon sources and detectors, um, and we were able to show, or people at NIST were able to show video streaming and through space with a QKD channel, and this line of sight. Um, we, we are not actively still doing QKD research, um, and we support NSA's position that it's not an end-to-end -end or scalable uh, solution, that we really need you know, post-quantum cryptography because that's what it'll, things will rely on. Um, but I think there are, uh, I'm sure there are some niche applications where the kind of data in transit, which QKD protects very well, can be an important application. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's an interesting case of where um, the technology is, in some sense, commercially available and the private sector, you don't compete with the private sector. Never. Um, so, uh, I guess I asked you already a little bit about how you collaborate with others. Um, maybe we can just take a few minutes to talk about the workforce you're not, you know, like universities train the, the future scientists and engineers in a sense, but NIST does play an important role. And, and I know many of the members of QEDC have founders and employees who came through NIST. And so you really are kind of part of the workforce pipeline. Um, how does that work? Yeah, so we're a consumer and a creator in the workforce pipeline, I guess you could say. Um, we're very proud that, you know, yeah, workforce isn't kind of clearly in our mission like it is in the NSF, let's say, where that's kind of the training is part there. But primarily through our joint institutes and from people working on the NIST campus, we've trained a, a large number of, of quantum engineers, quantum scientists, quantum researchers that have gone out and kind of into different industry, into different companies. Uh, like I said, there's some that are direct spin-offs. Well, they're not spin-offs in the technical term, but you can clearly see the lineage of the technology coming out of NIST labs into the companies. The other thing that I want to point out is um, in this ever research security and research protection is talked about a lot, and it's an important topic, but I want to make it clear that my position and this position is that research is an international endeavor and that we need and we rely on international guest researchers in our, in our laboratories, in my laboratories, to really get work done. So we, we're open to collaborations both you know, in the US, like we were talking about earlier through creatives, but we have a large number of guest research that could come over from other universities around the world, from industry around the world, from other NMIs, and we really value that, the knowledge and insight and the collaboration. So we see that it, we need to balance the kind of risk of kind of open research, but it's really right now for sure in this kind of, you know, the early stages, we need to source all the good ideas we can. We're not, we can't kind of close our borders. Not saying that anybody's saying that, but just to be clear that we, that I see this as a really important part of it and that kind of having that is part of our workforce solution, that we cannot train enough people here in the U.S. to do everything that needs to be done. Yeah, not all parts of government are able to do that kind of partnership, but your position is a little unique. Yeah, no, no, we've been, we've been lucky. I mean, really, international engagement is part of our core mission because we need to collaborate with the other metrology institutes around the world. So we will always be doing that. There's no way around that. If there's going to be standardization and measurements, we can't standardize them alone. It doesn't mean anything. So we have to be stay engaged. So I'm going to put you on the spot again, uh, since you <laughs> sit in our Department of Commerce, and one of the, they do have some regulatory responsibilities, especially in the area of export controls. And um, so the folks who are responsible for setting that 
need technical input and insights. And so I'm guessing that maybe NIST plays a role in helping to inform those kinds of regulations. Yes, we're, we're in conversation, especially around you know, export controls on quantum technology, which is being discussed. That's not a secret. Um, and it's really understanding, you know, one, you know, what's, what's the right uh, technology, the science, how do we understand it to make sure anything that's in a sound, but really that we need to maintain, as I was saying, this open research environment, and that if we put too restrictive, we're going to uh, really tamp down on what kind of engagement we can have internationally. So we are involved. We do not set the export standards or the export regulations, just to be clear, but we are involved in you know, informing some of those decisions, I would say. Great. So for those of you who want to have an input to someone who has the ear of the regulators, you can talk to Jim. Thank you so much. I didn't want to leave it on a, a sort of um, scary topic, so maybe just give you the last word on sort of where you're excited to see Quantum go uh, as we look forward from this year's Quantum World Congress to one in a year from now. Well, I mean, for, for a year from now, but I'm also going to look forward for the next five years. So the NQI is going to be reauthorized this year. And then we have five years to really deliver on this promise that we have made everybody. So, you know, what the new quantum sensing, the new application space, the novel algorithms that can be done on, you know, these intermediate scale quantum computers, what are we going to develop as a community that's going to demonstrate to the taxpayer who funds us all, at least funds me, uh, that this was worthwhile. So that's what I'm excited about. Excellent. Well, thank you. On that positive note, I want to thank you. And thank you all for coming. And thanks to uh, the Connected DMV for organizing. Yes.